morning. Welcome to the IDS Alarm Basics training. Uh, this is going to be a simple training that uh, just ensures everyone has decent foundation of knowledge going into our future training courses. So in this training, we'll discuss you know, the basics of electricity and circuits, how to use a multimeter and soldering iron, um, and lastly, introduce you to all the alarm system components. Okay, so let's get started. What is electricity? It is the movement of electrons from a high potential, 12 volts, to a lower potential, 0 volts. Uh, it may be a steady one-way current known as direct current or alternating from positive to negative many times a second known as alternating current. You would have heard of AC being 50 hertz or 60 hertz. Um, this is how many times in a second the electrons alternate between positive and negative. Voltage is the electrical force or pressure that causes currents to flow in a circle. It's measured in volts. Um, just note that AC and DC power are usually not interchangeable. A device that needs DC power usually will not work with AC power and can cause serious damage if AC is used uh, and vice versa. Current is the movement of electrical charge, the flow of electrons through an electronic circuit. Current is measured in amperes or amps. When we talk about how much power a device uses, we are generally talking about how much current it draws. Um, resistance is anything that causes an opposition to the flow of electricity in a circuit. So it is used to control the amount of voltage or current in a particular circuit. Uh, resistance is measured in ohms. Uh, resistors, uh, these are components that cause resistance are often used in alarm systems, most notably uh, when an alarm zone is end of line resistor supervised, uh, which we'll go through a little bit later. Ohm's law, as you can see on the slide, Ohm's law defines the relationship between power, uh, voltage, current, and resistance. So for example, one ohm is the resistance value through which one volt uh, will maintain a current of one amp. So a whole bunch of formulas can be derived from this relationship. Um, voltage is equal to the current times resistance, or the current is equal to voltage divided by resistance, or resistance is equal to voltage divided by current, which is why this triangle is uh, such a nice representative. Um, you can easily work out the formulas if you can just remember where uh, those symbols belong in the, in the triangle. Um, very important, the more currents you draw from a control panel, the lower the voltage will be that the panel can supply. So if your panel or power supply is rated at one amp and you start drawing more than that, your voltage coming out will start dropping significantly to where it can't properly power your devices. And this will happen on a lot of sites where the panel is rated for 750 milliamps and you're actually now drawing an amp and you only end up getting 11 volts at the keypad or peripheral. Um, and very often troubleshooting lands up just being a power issue. You can calculate power. So power is calculated in watts or voltage amps. Um, the formula for calculating power is an easy one. It's just your volts times your amps. So your voltage times your current. So when a 16 volt transformer is rated at 32 VA, it means that transformer can supply two amps. So 16 volts times two amps makes it a 32 VA transformer. So what is a circuit? A circuit is a closed loop that electrons can travel in. Remember I said that electricity is the movement of electricity. Well, a circuit is what it moves through. A source of electricity, such as a battery, will provide electrical energy. The movement of electrons in that circuit. Unless the circuit is closed, as in making a full circle back to the electrical source, no electrons will move. There is usually some sort of appliance, uh, like that light bulb, um, that uses electricity in the circuits, 
the appliance may, for example, provide light or sound or uh, an alarm system. Um, as I said, resistors are used a lot in alarm systems uh, to reduce voltage going to LEDs or most commonly to supervised zones. Resistors can have four, five or six colored bands that tell you about its properties. The bands are read from left to right with the bands getting further apart the closer to the right they get. So when you see the bands close together and getting further, you know, on the right hand side, they're the close ones. Um, and then you'll have a chart. You, it'll be in your booklet if you've downloaded it. So you can read uh, the chart from there. Um, and so for example, a four band resistor will have a band for two digits, a multiplier and a tolerance. A five band resistor will have an additional band for a third digit. Uh, and a six band resistor will have an additional band for temperature coefficient. So at what temperatures it can uh, run at. To read a resistor's value, you just take the digit bands and multiply them by the multiplier. So in a four band resistor, there are two digit bands. In a five or six band resistor, there are three digit bands. Uh, resistors are never the exact value that the color code indicates. Um, therefore, manufacturers place a tolerance color, color band. Uh, on the resistor to tell you how accurate, accurate this resistor was made. For example, at IDS, we use a 3K3 resistor on our zones. That's 3,300 ohms. So the colors would be orange, orange for 3,3, three, three, if you have a look at the slide, and red for a multiply of 100. So 3,3 three times 100 is 3,300. And then you'll often have a tolerance band uh, of gold, um, is the most common that we supply, I think, which is about 5%. So when you measure it with a multimeter, you will find that um, you won't get 3,300 ohms exactly. You'll maybe get three, two and a half or three, four and a half because there's always that little bit of tolerance um, in a resistor. So I just wanna see. Okay, normally open and normally closed circuits. Um, I ask that everyone please take your time to try and understand these. Um, it is something that a lot of people struggle with, struggle to understand um, what a normally open uh, circuit is, what a normally closed circuit is, and what relays are and how they, how they work. Um, so normally open and normally closed describes the normal or resting state of a switch in a circuit. Um, if a switch is normally open, it will change state to closed when the switch is triggered. If a switch is normally closed, it will change state to open when the switch is triggered. Okay, so remember for electricity to flow, you need a closed circuit. If you have a circuit with a normally open switch, uh, then electricity will not flow until the switch changes state to closed. However, if you have a circuit that is normally closed, uh, then electricity will always flow until you change the state um, to open. Okay, so for example, you're using a relay, um, which we'll go through now, and you want to power a siren. You don't want it to power all the time, so you'll wire it to the normally open. So when you trigger it's closed, that's when it will uh, sound. Okay, so relays, they are used in security systems when you want to switch on or off an external device, but your alarm outputs can't supply the power needed. Most PGMs or programmable outputs on alarm panels supply very little currents. So if you want to power a light or another siren, then you will need a relay with a separate power supply, different power uh, source. Uh, a relay will be triggered by the alarm output, which changes the relay state between open and closed. This allows the external device to be powered from a separate PSU power supply. And when the alarm output triggers, the relay then switches the device to either get power or take power off, depending if you wanna switch it on or switch it off. Okay, next I'm going to uh, show a little practical video of how to wire a relay.
In this video, I'm going to show you how to wire a relay. Your relay may look slightly different to the one shown here, but your connector should be the same. There's a negative and positive input that will trigger the relay, and then there's the relay connectors, normally open, normally closed, and common. In this demonstration, I'm going to connect a siren to an onboard output. Because the outputs cannot supply enough power, we are going to use a relay and an external power supply to power the siren. Think of a relay as a switch similar to a light switch, where you are just switching the electrical circuits on or off. A relay has two sides, the relay side that switches open and closed, and the trigger side. When the relay receives 12 volts, the normally closed will open, and the normally open will close. First we will wire up the relay side, we will connect the siren's negative directly to the power supply. Then we will connect the positive through the relay. If we want the siren to sound all the time and only switch off when the relay receives 12 volts, then we would connect to normally closed. In this case, we only want the siren to sound when we trigger the relay, so we will connect it to normally open. See the circuit we have created? with the relay in line so it can open and close the circuits. Now we connect the 12 volt trigger to the panel's PGM. I have pre-programmed this PGM so that it follows the panel's siren. When I trigger the panel's panic, you can see the relay's light switch and you can hear that the siren is now sounding. If I disarm the panic, you can see the relay switch back and you can hear that the siren has stopped. Uh, a diode a diode is a, a specialized electronic component with two electrodes called the anode and the cathode. The special property of a diode is that it only allows electricity to flow in one direction from the anode, the positive side, to the cathode, the negative side. Diodes are often used to protect circuits from being damaged by the power's polarity being reversed or to protect uh, components from back EMF, uh, electric magnetic field, which is a voltage that pushes against the current, um, which induces it. So diodes will usually have a stripe to indicate the cathode, the negative side. Electricity will not come in through that side. So connect the side to the negative side of the circuit and the anode to the positive side of the circuit. Um, these are very handy components uh, to use with relays, actually, um, especially if you are switching um, a, a device that is using a, a good couple amps. So, for example, if you've got a, a, a door closer or, or magnetic door lock um, that you, you know, but th switching three amps on and off all the time, um, you can quite easily seize the relay after a little while because you've got this back EMF coming back into the, into the relay. So you put a diode, which stops any of that coming back into the relay itself. LEDs or light emitting diodes, um, which we use a lot in alarm systems. They are di diodes that emit light uh, when electricity passes through it. The cathode side is indicated by a flat part of the LED. Uh, you'll also see that the positive leg is longer than the negative leg. Uh, LEDs are usually used to indicate the state of a panel, most commonly if an alarm panel is armed or if it's disarmed. Okay, using multimeters. You cannot troubleshoot alarm system problems without a multimeter. Okay. Multimeters are used to measure and check a multitude of things, most commonly voltage, currents, resistance, and continuity. Um, so for voltage, to measure voltage, turn the dial on your multimeter to the V symbol. Uh, you will notice that there are two V symbols. This is for direct current and alternating current. So if you are measuring AC, alternating current, then use the alternating current symbol, which is the first one on the picture, this little squiggly line. On the, and if you're measuring direct current, DC, then select the DC symbol, which is the one that it's actually selected now, which is a line with three dots underneath it. Um, measure voltage to check that the correct power is being supplied to the device. If there's too much voltage being supplied, you could blow components, or if there's too little, the device won't switch on. 
please always measure the voltage at the device um, so that uh, you could measure at the panel or the power source uh, and it'll tell you, you know, you've got 12.3 volts and but you're running a 50 meter wire that's got a high resistance and actually if you ended up measuring it at let's say the keypad or you know the detector you're only getting 11 11 volts and it's quite possible it happens often um, remember cable the further you are trying to run the the lower the voltage will be and cable has you know its own resistance um, per meter so uh, very important always measure at the device because you could be troubleshooting for a whole day because you measured it at the panel and didn't realize that you actually weren't getting enough voltage at the device that you troubleshooting Um, Martin, I did say in the beginning that uh, I won't be unmuting anyone just because it'll be too interruptive and too many questions all at once. So if you do have a question, please um, just type it in the chat. Um, okay, uh, continuity. Uh, measure continuity to see that you do not have a break in uh, the circuits. Um, if there's no continuity, then the devices you're connecting to won't talk to each other or receive power. So the multimeter will usually beep when it detects continuity. Uh, continuity is usually a little symbol that looks almost like a Wi-Fi symbol um, facing sideways. Um, I, I, there will be a demonstration later so you can see. Uh, current, so to measure current, turn the dial on your multimeter to the A symbol for amps. You will notice that there are two A symbols. This is for, again, direct current and alternating current. Um, uh, if you are measuring AC, then select the squiggly line. If you're measuring DC, then the, the line with the three dots underneath. Measure currents to check how much power is being drawn from your power source. Every electronic device draws um, a certain amount of power to operate, and the power source can only supply so much current at a time. So be sure not to draw more current than your power source can handle. When measuring current, the multimeter must be in line with the circuit and you'll always need to move the positive plug on the multimeter. Do not forget to move it back or you will blow the fuse when measuring voltage the next time you use the multimeter. That's bound to happen. The most experienced guys do it. So you move the plug to the amp, you measure it and you forget and then you measure voltage the next day and there's a little fuse inside your multimeter that's going to pop. Okay, and uh, to me measure resistance, turn the dial on your multimeter to the ohm symbol, um, and it will tell you the resistance quite easy. So if you're measuring a resistor, you just put the, the probes on either side of the resistor, and it will tell you how many ohms that's, that resistor is. There is a, a video, a practical video to show you how to use a multimeter next. In this video, I'm going to show you how to use a multimeter. To measure voltage, turn the dial to the voltage measurements you will see that there's AC and DC. Make sure to turn the dial to the correct voltage that you would like to measure. If you are measuring the voltage going to a device, it is best practice to measure the voltage at the end of the cable and not directly on the power supply. Place the red probe on the positive of the power supply or battery and place the black probe on the negative of the power supply or battery. To measure resistance, turn the dial to the resistance measurement, represented by the ohm symbol. Place the probes on either end of the resistor. To measure continuity on a cable or in a circuit, turn the dial to the continuity measurement you may need to press a special button to select continuity. Hear the beep when the probes are pressed together. 
The sister indicates that the circuit is complete. Place a probe on either end of the wire. If the multimeter beeps, then there is continuity on that wire. If you are measuring a long cable, you can always twist two wires on one end and then measure continuity on the other end. This will measure for both wires. To measure current, you need to have the multimeter in series with the circuit. Move the red probe to the current measurement position. Make sure you move the red probe back when you finish, or you may blow the fuse on the multimeter. Turn the dial to the current measurement. Disconnect either the positive or the negative wire. Then place a probe on the wire you've just disconnected and the other probe from the connector you've disconnected it from. You should see that the device is now powered back up. And you'll note on the multimeter the current that is being drawn by that device. Alarm panel and peripherals. So the alarm panel is the brain of any security system. The circuitry in the control panel senses a broken contact and then sounds a siren, triggers an output and or report to a monitoring company. Most modern control panels will have inputs for sensors, outputs to trigger external devices and a telephone dialer or serial output for communication to a monitoring company. All the alarm settings are stored in the control panel. All the user codes and permissions are stored in the alarm panel. The alarm panel must be installed in a built-in cupboard or just below the ceiling board in a protected area. Uh, that's with a detector protecting the area, never in the ceiling, which is obviously a high risk area. A battery. So all alarm systems must have a 12 volt DC battery, which supplies the currents when the siren and or radio triggers. So most alarm panels won't be able to supply that much power. Um, so it will also run the system for a limited time period during mains failure. Batteries are rated at amp hours, AH. This is the amount of time the battery will run with a current draw of one amp. So for example, seven amp hour battery can supply one amp of current for seven hours until there's zero voltage. Okay, so this is very important. A lot of people try and ask us how long does a battery last? It is almost impossible to tell you um, it depends on how old the battery is, how many times it has its cycle drained and charged again. Um, if you're drawing one amp, you will not get seven hours because your devices will stop working at about you know, 10 and a half, 11 volted, uh, volts. So the seven, hour, seven amp hour is until the battery is at zero volts. So you'll, for some of the panels will have a cutout. So at uh, 10 and a half volts, it'll cut out so you don't damage the battery. Um, so you're obviously not going to get seven hours. Uh, it's very, very difficult to predict exactly how long it's, it's going to last um, without actually just trying to test it. Um, but obviously the larger the amp hour, the longer the battery will last. Okay? However, the longer the amp hour, uh, the longer the battery will take to charge. So seven or eight amp hour are the most common used in security systems. If you need a longer battery backup time, don't increase the battery size as the panel won't be able to ma manage you know, recharging it. We recommend rather remove detectors from the panel power and use a separate battery backup for, um, with a power supply. So um, again, with load shedding here in, in South Africa, we um, get a lot of questions about you know, battery backups and power. Um, and we recommend the most is to you have your normal eight hour battery for the panel and maybe depending how big the system is, a keypad, and then you have your beams and detectors on a separate power supply with its own battery. And if you've got a big system, that power supply can have an 18 amp hour battery as long as it's big enough, which will give you plenty of um, many hours of, of backup time. Okay, so don't try and put an 18 amp hour battery on the panel itself it's never going to work. The panel's going to, it's never going to charge it. So rather separate your, your detectors from your, from your panel and keypad. 
The keypad can be classed as the user interface for the alarm system. The keypad is an indoor unit that controls all functionality of the alarm system. Um, it is from this device that a user is able to arm and disarm the security system, and it is where an installer can program the alarm panel. Uh, the keypad must be located in a convenient location that makes it easy for the user to operate. Um, it is also common for there to be more than one keypad in a system, uh, especially when you're using multiple partitions. So you can have one keypad for partition one and one keypad for partition two. Or if you've got a big house, one keypad on one side by the front door and one keypad on the other side by the second door. Okay, obviously you get a few different types of keypads. Um, you get an LED, which just displays the, the numbers. Uh, so you'll have your zone numbers one to 16. And when you've got to go into programming, you've, you need to try and interpret these numbers for what the programming is. But more and more commonly, people are using the LCD. It's nice and easy to use, and it just displays everything on the, the keypad itself. So you will see the zone that's triggering. You'll see if it's armed and disarmed. And when you're programming, it's much easier. You can see what the location is. You can see what setting is set up in that location. Okay, let's go to your expanders. Expanders are used to extend the functionality of a security system. There are many types of expanders that will enhance or expand the features of an alarm system in different ways. Some common ones, uh, some common expanders, as you can see on the screen, are wired zone expanders. So this will increase the amount of zones available in a system. You also have the wireless zone expanders, which can allow you to add wireless detectors to the system as well as output expanders, which will increase the amount of outputs available in the system. So more and more people are trying to automate their house and they need um, you know, 10 or 12 outputs that the panel can maybe trigger, um, or they've just got many garages and gates. Um, you can have an output expander that allows you to um, trigger through the remotes on the panel, or if you have an app relating to the panel, you can trigger it from there. Um, LEDs, um, they are most often used to indicate uh, certain events have occurred on the alarm system. Like I said earlier, most commonly used to indicate if a partition is armed and disarmed. Um, LEDs use very little current to switch, um, so most alarm system outputs will be able to power an LED directly. Um, in the case that an alarm panel output doesn't supply enough power for a particular LED, then use a relay board um, to switch the LED on and off. A lot of people, again, with the load shedding, a lot of people are actually using LEDs with a little power supply um, around the house and connected to an output on your panel that is triggers for AC failure. So whenever you get an AC failure on your alarm system, more often than not, that's the electricity has gone off and automatically with the use of a relay and a separate power supply, these LEDs can um, switch on automatically throughout the house. Um, so sirens and strobes are used to indicate certain events that happen on the alarm panel, usually high priority events such as burglaries or panics. Um, they can also be used to trigger when arming and disarming. So you want the siren to toot when you arm it and toot when you disarm it. So you, if you're using a remote, you know that the, the panel's actually armed itself. There will always be an output on an alarm panel dedicated to a siren or strobe. Sirens connected to an alarm panel must be self-driven, meaning you can't just put a speaker or a siren that requires a certain frequency to drive it, because it will just be power. So the siren must be self-driven where you put power in it and it makes the siren noise. Uh, sirens are uh, auditory indicators of an event and is also used to deter intrusion by making a loud noise, drawing attention to an intruder. Uh, strobes are a visual indicator and often used when uh, loud sirens are not permitted or um, not wanted on a property. Okay, transformers, which we've spoken about earlier. So all alarm panels uh, alarm systems must have a transformer which supply power to the panel. Most common is a 16 volts or for IDS, we use a 16 volt AC transformer. 
Um, so always check the manual for the correct transformer specifications. Transformers are rated in volts, amps, uh, VA. This is the amount of current draw the transformer can supply at any given time. So as we saw earlier, 16 volts AC transformers rated at 40 at VA can supply two and a half amps of current. Don't ever draw more current than your transformer is capable of supplying. This can damage the transformer and potentially cause a fire hazard. Um, many people do it. I've done it myself. You, you, you think it can handle this big system that you've got and um, you walk into an office full of smoke. Um, so that's, that's just about it for the peripherals. There are obviously many other uh, more specific peripherals that can go on an alarm system. Um, some can be, will be discussed in future trainings on specific alarm panels, but these are just the basic, most common um, alarm system components used in a, in a typical installation. Okay, so here we have uh, detectors and sensors. Um, the detectors or sensors are used to detect intrusion in a protected area. We have many different types of detectors and or sensors. So for example, a door contact, uh, which you can see is the middle picture there. These are used to protect openings such as doors and windows. Uh, there are two parts to this device. The magnet is placed on the opening side of the door window. The reed switch, uh, the side with the wire in it is placed on the fixed side of the door or window. Now a reed switch is a very thin glass tube that has a very, very thin metal plates or two metal plates in it, which are very close together, but they're not touching. So the circuit is always open when the magnet gets close or for example, the door closes, uh, it, the magnet pulls the two metal pl uh, plates together, closing the circuit. Um, this is why door contacts are normally closed devices. So when installing them, you install them as a normally closed device because when the door's closed, the circuit is closed. Um, just a tip, the closer that the door contact is installed to the hinge of the door or the window, the, um, the more you can open it before it's activated. So for example, you have a client, they have a, a window they want to keep open or open sometimes for the cats, for example, um, you just the, try and install that door contact closer to the hinge um, and you'll be able to open the, that window further than if it was at the, the end of the window or further from the hinge. Panic buttons, uh, these are just push buttons uh, that are usually um, open circuits that are closed when you press the button, although nowadays you're getting uh, push buttons that can be either, so open or closed, depending on how you want to wire it. Um, so what that is, you have these around the house, they don't require any power, just wired to a panic zone on the panel, and when you press the button, the panel knows, okay, that's a panic and sends out a panic to, to the monitoring company. Beams. Okay, so if you have a look at your screen on the left hand side, you have the two black beams there. Um, so these are active infrared devices that work in pairs, uh, with one being a transmitter that sends an infrared signal and the other a receiver that receives the signal. So when the infrared signal is broken, i.e. somebody blocks the signal, then the beam triggers an activation. The infrared signal is not like a thin beam, like a laser beam that you often see in movies, uh, but it actually gets wider the further away from the transmitter you go. Okay, so if your beam is too powerful for your application, for example, you've got a 100 meter beam, but you've wired it at, installed it at 50 meters from each other, and it is very common for it to not pick up an intruder uh, the closer they get to the middle of the, um, of the beam. Okay, so what happens is the transmitter pumps out this big um, infrared signal and because it's uh, too close to the receiver, when someone walks through it, the, the infrared actually is big enough to go around them, not losing connection to the receiver. A lot of infrared beams will have uh, a sensitivity. So, you know, if you do have a hundred meter and you want to do it at 50 meters, sometimes you can push it all the way down to low sensitivity and that will help. Um, 
Uh, and obviously, it's a, if you have a, a, a 30 meter beam and you want to make it 50 meters, that's not going to work because it's not going to push it further enough. So it's very important to know the distance you want to cover and to get the appropriate beam to cover that distance. Otherwise, you can have endless problems, false alarms because it's too far or not picking up intruders because uh, it's too close. Uh, passive infrareds. So if you have a look on the right hand side, that's uh, an indoor passive. Um, these are the most common devices used um, today when designing a security system. Um, a PIR, passive infrared, detects the change in temperature in a specific area. This change in temperature is received and processed. If the change is sufficient, then the sensor, the sensor will trigger an activation. Okay. Um, we'll go into passive infrared a, bit, a little bit more now because it is uh, the most common and also uh, most commonly misunderstood. Um, um, there are many other types of detectors that sense conditions such as vibrations, glass breaking, water levels, temperatures, gas, and, and more. Um, we're not going to go through all of them. These are your, your most common. Okay. So passive infrareds, passive means that the detector does not emit any type of signal like, like the beams. The PIR looks for infrared to leave an object such as a, a human body um, and for that infrared to reach the sensor, which can then trigger the PIR. <clears throat> passive infrareds are often called movement sensors. This is actually bad terminology um, as they do not detect movements at all, but rather sense the change in temperature. The sensor in the PIR has a limited pickup. Um, therefore, a Fresnel lens is used to concentrate the infrared on the pickup. So if you have a look at a, a detector, there's a little lens in front of the sensor uh, that often has little ridges in it. Okay. Um, uh, and these little ridges cause um, what we like to call detection fingers. So they split that sensor into all these fingers and you need to cross those detection fingers um, before it's triggered, um, which is determined by the pulse count. So the pulse count will determine how many detection fingers are required to trigger before an alarm is generated. Okay, so your pulse count is two. Uh, you'll have to cross two of those uh, detection fingers. If your pulse count is four to reduce false alarms, you'll have to cross four of those detection fingers. So when installing um, a certain application, just be aware of where an intruder is most likely to come because you want them to cross the detector. And, and obviously, if you've, uh, for example, if you have a look there, you've got pet friendly, it doesn't have the volumetric up down detection fingers. So you might not want to have four pulse counts because it'll take a while before it picks up somebody. You'd rather, um, you'd rather have it uh, on two, so it'll pick up someone quicker, okay? So because the PIR looks for change in temperature, any sudden rise or drop of temperature can cause an alarm. This makes planning your install, um, where you install the PIR detector to avoid uh, false alarms. So keep away from electrical cables that may uh, interfere with the wiring as well as creates a change of temperature when big devices switch on and off. Um, don't expose to air drafts, uh, open windows, that's uh, gonna have a quick change in temperature or at the heat sources such as a fireplace or a, um, a heater. Um, and then it pre prevents direct sunlight from reaching the PIR, especially when dealing with outdoor detectors. So this is one that's a lot of people don't think of. Uh, it's a, a call we get um, at our help desk very often that says, um, you know, our detector works beautifully during the day, but, you know, either early morning um, at half past six, 
uh, at false alarms, there's nobody there, or uh, in the evening at, when, at half past six um, or seven, it's at false alarms and there's no one there. And uh, after some investigation, we find out that you know, it's facing east or west or it's facing the sunrise or facing the sunset. So what happens is as soon as you know, you've got a cold morning and the sun rises, that sun directly hits the, the detector and um, can cause a, a false alarm. Okay, because remember the PIR is looking for a change in temperature. So obviously you have an area you want to detect and it might be facing that area. You might have to be a little bit creative with where you install the detector, um, try to face it on a, a perpendicular wall and not directly towards where the sun is, is setting or sun is rising. Um, PIR lenses, they come with different purposes. So um, as you can see on the screen, you have volumetric. Uh, this is just a standard PIR monitoring uh, an area from the ground up. Uh, each detector will have its own spec on how far it can detect and what angle it can detect at. Um, uh, Pet-friendly PIR, this usually creates an alley between the floor and the detection area. Um, and there's often a low mount detector. So what you'll do is you'll mount it at about one meter and then it will be able to leave a, a small half a meter underneath, okay? There's no such thing as a pet immune detector. Um, a detector cannot tell the difference between a large dog and a man crawling. So there is limitations. If you have a site and they've got dogs and they don't want the dogs to be detected, they must know that there's a risk of someone also being able to call um, to call under. Okay, a detector, um, unless you start going to very expensive laser type detectors, but a, a PIR detector is not going to know the difference between a big Rottweiler or a man just crawling on the ground. So keep that in mind. You also get curtain PIRs. Um, these have a vertical pattern running parallel with the area you want to protect. So it creates a solid protection zone that you walk through, it will trigger. And then you get a, a corridor PIR. So this is usually the, a, a longer distance, uh, say 24 meters, but a very narrow width. So, you know, one meter, um, you know, down the side of a house or down a, a corridor as it's named. Okay. You also get dual PIR detectors, so or, or dual technology detectors. These are detectors that use microwave technology to monitor for movement with a PIR to monitor for temperature change. Okay, so uh, you won't see a microwave on its own very often um, because there's a slight disadvantage, which is micro microwave can penetrate certain materials or most materials. So this means movements outside of the area that uh, you know, you're trying to protect um, can cause a detector to, to alarm. So uh, if somebody is walking behind the fence, a microwave can often pick that up. Or we've actually known um, microwaves to pick up um, these big water. So we've got these big water, they had these big water pipes inside of a wall and uh, the water would be off and then move and then the, the microwave would actually pick up the movement of the water in the pipes. Um, so you very seldom see microwave on its own. So you'll have microwave looking for movements and then you'll have a PIR um, looking for um, temperature. Okay, and the two working together um, will, will help to stabilize detection in harsher environments as the PIR and the microwave will have to detect motion and temperature before the detector triggers an alarm. Okay, so uh, generally use an outdoor environment or environments that can change temperature quickly. So you wanna marry the temperature change and the motion detection. Hopefully that all made sense. Um, there's a lot of misconception about PIRs. Um, so it's quite important that I think you understand uh, it detects temperature change and there are ways around it. Okay, and you have a pulse count and there are ways around it. So just be very careful when installing. Um, if somebody's got to trigger, you know, two or four of these um, PIR beams at a single time and they decide they're going to take an hour to move across the room, 
it's quite possible that they just move slow enough that it doesn't pick up the temperature change. Or if they walk with something in front of them, a big sheet or, or something, they can actually, unless it ha you have some uh, uh, motion sensing, um, it's quite possible for you to beat a PIR because it's only looking for temperature change. So just keep that in mind when um, designing a site or project. So when an intrusion or a panic occurs, the system needs a way of notifying someone. So whether it is your cell phone uh, with an app or to a security monitoring company, there are many devices that can connect to an alarm panel that will communicate events to you or to your monitoring company. Um, these devices will communicate through telephone lines over a radio frequency or using the cellular network. Um, radio transmitters, so uh, th these use radio frequencies and they just send out bursts of information in the direction of a radio tower. The big downfall of radio transmitters, these are UHF or VHF radio transmitters, is that you can't monitor whether you've missed a signal. Okay? Um, obviously you have your auto test that checks every day, but you can't monitor if it's gone down or if they've sent a signal and it didn't get through. Okay. Uh, when installing radio transmitters, uh, remember the antennas must be mounted vertically. Um, coppers, copper pipes, geysers, metal poles, they, these must be, all be kept at least two meters away from the antenna. Nearby metal objects can alter the antenna's characteristics, causing power to be reflected back into the transmitter instead of being radiated out. And obviously bending an antenna to fit into a confined space can also alter its characteristics and cause transmitter power to be reflected back into the transmitter, significantly reducing the amount of power that gets radiated out. Okay, so something to know about a, a, um, those antennas is the characteristics of the antennas very much depends on um, its length actually. So very important not to, to try and bend it or move, change its shape in any way. Um, more and more commonly, GPRS communicators are being used. These rely on cell phone towers to transmit their signal. Um, these, this is beneficial as you are often ways of verifying if the signals have gone through, uh, which you can't do with radio. Um, and because these communicators work on cell phone towers, it's important to make sure you have decent signal or use an external extender to try and boost um, in low signal areas. So GPRS, you obviously are reliant. Um, uh, most cell phone towers have battery backups, but I'm sure some of you might have experienced when again, there's power shedding, uh, your cell phone also goes down for some reason. Uh, and that's probably because the batteries either aren't um, maintained or um, if you know, someone's stolen the batteries and then it's, and, and the, the, so, this, so it is dependent on the cell phone towers itself. Um, but especially in main metropolitan areas, these are usually very reliable. And the nice thing about it is you generally have some sort of platform or website that allows you to see all your units, make sure they're online and, um, um, and, and monitor that um, your customers are actually being reported to. And if any signals are missed, all communication devices are reliant on the medium they use to communicate, telephone lines, uh, radio frequencies, cell phone networks. So if you know an area is bad with any of these mediums, make sure you use a different communication device. So don't use telephone lines in an area that is known to have their lines go down or uh, cables to get stolen. Uh, don't use GPRS in the middle of nowhere where there's no cell phone reception. There are a couple of typical cable types that are used in the industry today and are named after the characteristics of the copper sensor core. Uh, each cable is protected by an outer sheath. You get a stranded cable, uh, which is many thin strands of copper, or you get a solid core cable, which is one thick strand of copper. Um, <clears throat> everyone has their own preference. Um, I personally prefer Stranded because uh, it's less likely to break. Um, a lot of people prefer solid because it's a little bit easier to get inside of connectors. So whatever your preference, they each have their own um, characteristics and advantages and disadvantages. 
Um, so we have comms cable. Um, this can be either a stranded or a solid core. Comms cable can come in many options from four core, which has four wires inside, to 20 core, which has 20 wires inside. Comms cable is usually used to connect devices for either power or communication, um, very commonly for both. Um, you'll use comms cable to run your key bus between your panel and your um, peripherals, like your keypad and expanders. Your people often use comms cable to run to the detectors because you can run your power and you can run your data uh, or your zone circuits on the same wire. Um, uh, you then have cab tire. I'm sure a lot of you have seen these in um, electrical appliances um, or extension leads. Uh, this is a three core stranded cable primarily used for high powered uh, voltage or current draw. Uh, the colors are almost always the same, uh, country dependent. Um, in South Africa, you have blue being neutral, brown being live, and green yellow being earth. You then have uh, ripcord, uh, which is a, or twin flex. Uh, it's, it's a twin stranded wire that comes in various thicknesses. For some records, the outside of one strand is marked with either a ridge or an identifying mark, um, which is normally used for positive as a standard. Um, and you know, you use the other side for negative. Um, this is something a lot of people don't know. So you're trying to run this long wire and you need to know what positive is and you actually trying to trace the, this wire, but if you actually feel the, the ripcord, the one cable will have a little ridge on it. So you wire the ridge into positive, you run your wire, you feel the ridge on the other side and you know that that's positive because that's the same cable you wired uh, before. Um, you get thinner ripcord, which is 0.2 mil. Um, these can be used to wire door contacts and vibration sensors. Um, don't use them for power, they, they are too thin. Uh, then you get thicker ripcord, um, the, quite commonly the 0.5 mil, um, and this is often used for power. You can put a pretty decent draw on this, and um, you can use it for your siren, you can use it for your radios and such. Um, so to go through some recommendations on cabling and wiring and alarm system. Um, so please, for your own sake or your company's sake, stick to a uh, cable uh, convention. So use the same colors for power, um, usually red for positive, black for negative. Use the same colors for communication bus. So for example, use green for the, the 485 positive and use white for 485 negative. So this way, if you need to troubleshoot or if you have another technician uh, comes to work on the system, the same colors are used uh, at all your clients' houses. Um, it just makes tracing and troubleshooting a lot easier. Also, um, I recommend spare wires should always be planned for. So for example, you need four wires for a key bus, two for power, two for data, use a six core cable. Okay, so use the wires that are needed and then just twist, like you can see on the picture, the unused wires around the cable uh, or around the sheath. This will prevent you from having to install a whole other cable if you, one or two of your wires break. So you run, you climbing in the ceiling, you've made this cable nice and neat, and you run it you know, 50 odd meters down the house, and you get to the other side and one of the cables has a break in it. You've now got to do that all over again. Whereas if you did a six core, all you have to do is swap out one of the cables on either end. Um, it, it will save you a lot of time and hassle, I promise. Think carefully when choosing cable. The copper core of a wire is very important as this is what carries the electricity. The thickness and material used can help or resist the flow of electricity. When using a cable that will supply a device with DC power, the diameter of the cable must match the amount of power required to delivery. Um, the length of the cable must also be considered. The longer the cable run, the more DC current and voltage will drop if the incorrect cable is used. Okay, so don't use a 0.2 mil ripcord to run power to anything. If you are using a comms cable, which is a fairly thin wire, but can 
transmit uh, or can carry electricity, but you're trying to run it 30, 40 meters, you, you'll notice a voltage drop. With comms cable, you can actually double up. So to, to technically make it a thicker wire. So what you'll do is you'll just twist two wires together on one side, the same two wires on the other side, which will allow the electric, more electricity to pass through if you need to make slightly longer runs. Um, I'm just gonna run through some cabling uh, do's and don'ts. Um, so, and things to consider when planning a cable route. So cables must be kept from any device that's carrying electricity um, or using you know, AC or DC power as they can affect a cable that is close enough by in inducing current into that cable, especially if you've got like a detector or you've got data running to a peripheral. If you have to cross a light, uh, for example, so you've got a 220 light, uh, light bulb in the ceiling, don't run it next to it. Keep contact to a minimum, rather cross the, the cable if you have to. Um, and this is just to prevent current being induced into the cable and interfering with the data being transmitted. Keep cables away from radio transmitters and the signal paths for the same reason. Keep cables away from anything that could rub against it and damage the cable. Make sure that you secure cables to permanent structures as temporary structures could move causing cables to be damaged. Um, always protect cables using conduits in a high traffic area. And when joining cables, use solder, okay? And insulate with insulation tape. Um, keep any joins in serviceable areas. So when you're troubleshooting, you know where they are and you can get to them easily. And uh, try not to bend wire or cables, rather loop it around an obstacle. Um, so if you need to take sharp, depending on the type of cable, if you need to take some sharp bends or, or loops, try and have a big circle um, so that the cables, and especially when using solid core, the cable doesn't get, uh, the wire doesn't get uh, broken. Uh, obviously don't pull or stretch the cable. So when you're feeding cable through little holes between walls, don't pull, pull, pull and stretch because uh, you'll end up uh, snapping something. Um, just make sure you've got a, a big enough uh, hole to thread the cable through or check that it's not catching on anything. And we recommend just keep a little bit extra at each end with a little service loop. So, you know, keep 30 centimeters or so more cable than you need to use for the distance and then just loop it around um, inside the alarm box or, or in the ceiling just so that, you know, if something happens or you're stripping it and you end up cutting the wire, you do have a little bit extra cable to, to work with. Um, again, you know, for your own ease, um, label cables at both ends so you know what's connected to what and keep a wiring diagram on site. Okay, so I know there was a lot, but uh, this should all be in your booklet for you to refer to later. And, um, you know, a, a lot of trouble can be avoided if just thinking carefully before running uh, cabling and wires. A lot of alarm system troubles come from incorrect wiring or um, you know, poor choices when wiring up devices. Okay, I've got a little video for you next. In this demonstration, I'm going to show you a basic way to solder a resistor to a wire. Your soldering station should consist of a soldering iron and a wet sponge that allows you to clean your soldering iron. Make sure you have sufficient apparatus to hold the wire while you are soldering it. Do not place the solder directly on the soldering iron. You must first heat the copper wire and allow the wire itself to melt the solder. This will draw the solder around the wire to tin it. If you are joining two pieces of copper wire together, you should tin both sides and then join the cables together. In this demonstration, I'm just going to connect a resistor to our tinned wire. Place the resistor against the tinned wire and remelt the solder. You can give it a quick blow so that it hardens quicker. 
Okay, not too much longer to go. So let's go through um, zones, partitions, and outputs. These are, um, you know, part of an alarm system and installing an alarm system or programming an alarm system. So what is a zone? A zone is a supervised circuit that connects a detector to the alarm panel. The circuit is constantly monitored. And when the detector triggers, the alarm panel sees the change in the zone circuit. The alarm panel can then react to the change based on its programming. Uh, this is where end of line resistors come into play. Uh, most alarm panels use end of line resistors to monitor a supervised zone circuit. So instead of monitoring just an open closed circuit, the alarm panel looks for the resistor in the circuits. This is to prevent an intruder from shorting the wires and gaining undetected access. Okay. So if it's you have a normally open device, you if you were to cut it, uh, it still wouldn't see the resistor. If you have a normally closed device, the resistor will be running through the circuits. If you cut it, you will lose the, the resistor. Okay, so in a normally closed circuit, the end of line resistor must be installed in series. This is so the circuit can flow through the resistor. And when the detector triggers, the circuit will open. In a normally open circuit, the end of line resistor must be installed in parallel. That's across the alarm outputs. This is so that the circuit can flow through the resistor. And when the detector triggers, the circuit is closed and the electricity will flow through the path of least resistance, skipping the resistor. Okay, so the hardware monitors for the change in status or open of zones, but the panel still needs to know what to do when a specific zone is violated. This is why we have zone types. So when programming the alarm panel, you can give each zone a zone type, and then this tells the alarm panel how to react to that zone. Uh, so to that zone. So some common ones, uh, you have an entry exit zone, um, this is a zone that allows entry into the building when the alarm is armed and allows exiting of the building during arming, um, most commonly on doors. Uh, follower zone. A follower zone is disabled during the arming cycle until the system is armed. Once the zone is active, uh, it will violate as soon as a violation occurs. So when the system is armed and an entry exit zone is triggered, a follower zone will disable itself until the user code is entered. Um, if not, then it will become active again. You also have a priority zone, also known as a panic zone. So regardless of whether the panel is armed or not, a violation of a priority zone will cause the control panel to register an alarm and sound the siren. <clears throat> uh, there is also a silent priority zone where the siren will not sound, but still report to the monitoring company. Instant zones. Um, so when a panel is armed, the violation of an instant zone will cause the control panel to immediately register an alarm condition and sound the siren. Um, you also get silent instant zones where the siren will, won't sound, same as the panic zones. You have, and then you have an arm and disarm zone. So a violation or a trigger of an arm disarm zone will cause the panel to toggle between arm and disarm. So depending on its current state, it will toggle to the opposite state. Uh, usually used nowadays with uh, remote receivers. So you have a relay on a remote receiver connected to an armed disarm zone. You press the remote, it triggers the zone and arms and disarms the house. Um, so that's zones, but what are what is a partition? Um, a partition is a group of zones that may be controlled independently from any other group of zones. So partitions will have each have their own separate settings, allowing them to act completely different from any other partition. Most likely, uh, or most commonly, you could have your house as a partition one and your perimeter as a separate partition two, uh, which can be controlled independently from another. Uh, another example is a business with many departments or offices. Each department can have its own partition that is armed and disarmed independently to paste the uh, based on the people working in that department. Okay, so when you programming an alarm panel, you'll often have global settings, which affects the whole panel, and then you'll have partition settings. So these partition settings will just affect the partition you're programming. Uh, so you can have siren two to four partition one, but not partition two, or um, and people can arm partition one and not an arm partition two separately.
Uh, and then we have outputs. Uh, all alarm systems will have programmable outputs. Um, they are called programmable because you can program them to trigger based on certain events. Uh, these outputs can be built uh, onto the alarm panel itself, or they can come on a wired uh, expander module. Outputs can either supply a voltage, um, allowing it to power a device such as an LED, or they can be dry contacts, meaning they only open and close a circuit, um, and you'll need to put voltage through it to, to power a device. Onboard outputs generally can only supply a small amount of current, enough to drive an LED, but not enough for a siren or a light bulb. Uh, for this, you'll need it to use a relay. Okay, and obviously, depending on what, which panel you have, uh, will depend on what sort of events can trigger an output. So generally, you'll have your AC fails and restores or low batteries. These events are pretty common, or obviously, burglary and panic, arm and disarm. Um, and then some panels will give you box tampers and will give you telephone dialer, um, missing troubles, uh, so any events that's on the panel. Um, you can generally trigger some sort of output to alert um, the homeowner or business owner. Okay, um, I have one more video to show you and then I think we are done. Um, so let's have a quick look. In this demonstration, I'm going to show you how to wire a door contact and a panic button. A door contact is a normally closed device, so the end of line resistor must be in series. The end of line resistor must be on the side of the device, and if it is in series, it must be soldered to the wire. The resistor is in series because the door contact is closed in its normal state. For the panel to see the resistor, it needs to be in line with the circuit. Once the door contact opens, the panel will no longer see the resistor. A panic button is a normally open device, so the end of line resistor must be in parallel. This means that it must be installed across the contacts of the panic button. Because the panic button is open, we cross the connectors with the resistor so that it completes the circuit. When you push the panic button down, it closes its own circuit and the panel will no longer see the resistor. And that's the difference in wiring a end of line resistor um, for a, a normally open device and a normally closed device. Um, okay, well, I'm just gonna, that was our last slide. So that's the training ended. Thank you for joining me. I hope it was uh, beneficial to you and um, I hope you all have a great day.